Welcome to another episode of the MyLands podcast, Six Figure Secrets of Fractional Experts. I'm really excited to be joined today by Cheryl Pluff. Cheryl, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Bradley, great to be with you today. Excited for this topic. Same. And so so give our audience maybe an overview of the work you do today, who you work with, how you help. We help coaches, consultants, and entrepreneurs to become icons in their niche. That's essentially what we do. How we do that is predominantly through podcasting. We do that through high ticket offers as well and helping people to really build a sustainable six and seven figure business. Ultimately, our goal is seven figure and beyond because we really believe that six figures is something you should be blowing by at this point (laughs) in in the world, right? Um, Blow past that milestone so that you can actually get to financial freedom, which is going to be found at the seven figure and beyond mark. So that's really uh, what we predominantly help people to do is build a real sustainable business uh, through their expertise and by leveraging their experience and and what they do. And just to clarify, you're you're recommending that they have the high ticket offers. They have their own podcast. Is that right? Yes, we do. We we also do walk our own talk, but we um, do believe that that is a great path for our coaches to follow because it allows them to stabilize their cash flow, which is often the problem that we see with early stage coaches and consultants who are trying to work through the Ascension model, which is they're trying to sell a $7 tripwire and then they're trying to get people to buy a course. And then they're trying to get the people to buy and they have to resell people all along the way, all the way up to the ultimate goal, which is their high ticket offer. What we say is start with the high ticket and then descend from there. Like use one one program, one offer to get you to seven figures and then descend from there. So it, what we often see is this um, topsy-turvy cash flow because they're trying so many things and they're a solopreneur and they're wearing all the hats and then ultimately nothing really gets built. I mean, there's just only so much you can do as a one person shop, right? Especially in the first year. That's the reality. Or, right. Yeah. The focus. <laughs> so And again, most of our audience are consultants, fractional executives, independent consulting, where they're really selling either marketing or product operations, those kinds of services to businesses. Um, So when we think about, you know, the the parallel might be someone comes in and it's like, oh, I'll do an an audit for 500 bucks or a thousand bucks for your business, like a marketing audit, right? And when that, that fractional marketing consultant really wants to offer, you know, $15,000 a month, right? And you're saying just sell the $15,000 a month retainer, right? Like you don't need to start with this small thing. What does that person need to do differently to one, wrap their mind around, okay, I'm just going to charge 15K and two, actually be able to get somebody to buy that from them? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is, especially in the agency model, I mean, really look at the value of the thing that you're providing. The solution that you're providing has massive value because typically in an agency model, a lot of it is a, it's a done for you, likely service based approach, right? You're doing something for them and they get massive value from that beyond just the tangible widget that you create. And so thinking beyond the, the widget, thinking beyond what value does that have in that person or that entrepreneur's or your client's life and then pricing based on value rather than what you think they can afford. I, I see that a lot, Bradley, where people are trying to to price themselves based on what they believe or they think someone can afford. And it's like, I always have to retool that and say, no, 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 catch yourself. It's not about what you're you're assuming, you're making an assumption about what someone can afford. They will afford what they see value in. And that's what you should be predominantly focused on is positioning your offer so that they can actually see the value. One of the things that we do in our program and what we teach our clients too is to uh, do uh, what we call strategic risk reversal, meaning that you structure your program around linking your payments to actual results. It's not just a guarantee. That's an actual, you don't pay us unless we get you those results. Mm. And so it's on. it's not common in the coaching space. We hope that we're going to be, you know, leading a charge around turning that around. But I think that's where I would start would be looking at value-based pricing rather than assuming that people can afford it based on your own beliefs around <laughs> what's right. in their checkbook. I know your background is really interesting in TV and broadcasting and media. Um, how did you, you know, what are maybe the, the top one or two things you learned in all those years there? And then how did you make this transition or why did you make this transition into, you know, running these programs and helping consultants 
and coaches really up level their business? Well, the thing that I learned was how to think on my feet. I learned how to communicate succinctly and speak in sound bites. I learned how to dissect information and be able to work with a vast amount of, in my case, scientific information, meteorological information, and then mine that down to a consumer level and be able to communicate that. So I did gain a lot of different skills and experiences through that. I think that if I look back on it now, I realized that I was already marketing long before I realized I was a marketer. I was marketing and I was doing that. I was building someone else's brand. And that's what I was paid to do. I'm not bitter about that. That's just the reality of where it was. I was an employee and I was building their brand. So it actually was a really natural progression for me to go from broadcasting into marketing and entrepreneurship because then I ended up doing it for myself and now more recently for Icon. So that's, um, that's what I learned. The second part of your question was? How did you really make the transition or why did you make the transition out of broadcast media into what you're doing yeah. now? For me, it was in 2013. There, I had an internal knowing head, heart, who knows, <laughs> source, right? Speaking to me and it was a nudge. You know, you often hear about people just get the nudge. For me, that's what it was. It was in 2013. Um, I just started getting this feeling and this nudge. I've always think I've had an entrepreneurial spirit or something inside of me that I didn't really enact. And so in 2013 is when I started you know, uh, paying more attention to personal development, listening to audiobooks, and bettering myself. It just also might have been the stage of life that I was at. I was, a, you know, uh, a new parent at that point too. And so I think my priorities changed. I got a nudge um, and I just decided to, to pursue it. And I just kind of fell in love with that. I had been a broadcaster for a long time. And I think it was just the challenge of something new as well. Yeah, very cool. You mentioned earlier uh, a niche right? And, and really winning your niche and, and the high value offer in your niche. Talk about the importance of one, of, an, of having one, and then how do you come up with your niche? I think the way that you come up with your niche is to really just think about, well, start with who is it that you would love to work with? I mean, start there. Start with what type of group or uh, subset of, of folks would you actually just really enjoy? Because we believe in having more life and more profit at the same time. I'm not interested in helping people paint themselves into a corner and building out a business that they hate in three years from now and make money at it. <laughs> it's like, there's more to life than that. I want people to have it all. I want people to be happy and enjoy their lives and, and be able to have better family time and, but also be profitable at the same time. So I think you start by thinking of who would I actually really just like to hang around with? And then ask yourself, do those people have problems that need solving? And do I have a skill set or something marketable that could help them to solve one problem? That's really where you, you start. If you can't think of who would I actually really like to, to hang around with, one thing you can do in this day and, and in this era is go to AI and ask. <laughs> you know, type, have a little chat with ChatGPT or Claude and ask it, just say, here's who I am. You know, you, you give it a role, you go through the whole process and give it a good prompt. And, and you can have a great conversation. If you don't already invest in having your own coach or a business coach of your own, um, then you can have that conversation or initiate a conversation with the chat GPT and, and ask it, you know, here's what I do. I'm interested in starting this and it will give you a whole bunch of ideas. And then I think from there, you can take that and mine down from it and go, oh, Hey, I haven't really thought of that angle, or that might be interesting. And then if you do have a business coach, you could take those results to your coach and say, Hey, I'd like to discuss these things on our next, next coaching call. Yeah. Um, so I think there are a variety of different ways, but at the end of the day, Bradley, I think it's, it's a getting in touch with yourself and figuring out what do I want my life to look like in two years from now or three years from now, as I'm working with people, what would make me happy? You talked about, you know, a podcast, right? And as one of the avenues, or I'll open up even further to say, okay, you talked about sustainable business, right? I want a seven figure business. I want it to be sustainable, growing. How do I, what, what do I need to be doing to make that happen for me? The, you have to have the fundamentals down. You have to have lead gen, you have to have conversion. You've got to be making offers. <laughs> Sometimes I talk to people who 
are hanging out a shingle. I'm a coach. I'm a consultant. And then I'll say, okay, great. So how many offers have you made? How many people have you met? How many stages have you been on? And the answer is zero, 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 zero. I go, okay, so we need to start with the basics. We have to go back to basics. You've got to get, you have to find a way to get in front of people. You have to be positioned as an authority. You have to be generating leads. You have to be, have a conversion event. We happen to support, um, doing that through what we call a strategic philanthropy workshop, which works extremely well. There are multitude of different ways that you can do that, but uh, convert leads, but we love that particular model. So you have to have a way to turn prospects into clients and then deliver the goods right on the fulfillment side. So, I mean, those are the fundamentals at the core of all that though, is this idea around building high trust relationships. You know, we are in a crazy era right now with all these algorithm changes and who knows what's going on from month to month, let alone, you know, day to day <laughs> on these platforms. And we're at the whim of these algorithmic changes. Platforms are coming on the scene, off the scene, changing names, who knows what. But amongst all of those things, if you think about going back to basics and building on a foundation that's strong, we know that building strong relationships in business will never go out of style. So focus on that. You know, we have at Icon Maker, we have over, I think now maybe 200 and counting referral partners, people that we've connected to and who not, they don't all Bradley promote all at one time, but we have a database of 200 people who've raised their hands and said, we'd love to help you promote hmm. based on their promotion calendar and we schedule that out and it's all planned in advance. We might have more promoting at certain times of year than others based on our promotional calendar or our event schedule. So all these things are mapped out and planned out. Um, but at, at, at its core, it's thinking about coming back to basics and not getting so overwhelmed, shall we say, with all these different bells and whistles and tactics du jour that are out. And one of the things, you know, is lead gen. Right. It's lead gen. It's being a, an authority figure. And then it's building those relationships. Tie those in for me. Like, how do I actually really do that? Where do the leads come from? Do I need to pay someone? What does it look like? You, I'm going to speak to it from the perspective of podcasting, especially, you know, your audience being um, fractional experts, fractional executives and um, boutique agencies. I think you have an opportunity in your in your sphere to really use and leverage podcasting and be very precise and almost sniper-like, right? Because hopefully you all, you've all you done the value pricing, you're offering your services, maybe on retainer or high ticket offers, and you don't need to have millions and millions of people following you for you to be successful. Therefore, you can take advantage of the podcast strategy of being precise about who is it that you want to meet. You know, we have a, an exercise that we do where we'll have clients or sometimes in our live events, we'll have people do an exercise where we say, who are 25 people or 10 people or 100 people that if they knew who you were, would be would have a drastic impact and a massive impact on your business. And, you know, it takes some time to write down a few names and then you go, okay, well, of those names. Now, if you're a podcast host, as you are, you could be strategic about going to those people on that list and inviting them to be a guest on your show rather than sending a cold DM, which will not get their attention. Now you're coming to them with a different approach and you're saying, hey, I have a podcast. I'd love to bring you on as an expert to speak about a said topic. You're going to get their attention, right? And so if you're a host, you can still use that same, uh, same approach, right? It's like, what specific shows do I want to be on as a guest because I want to build relationships with that particular person who's hosting that show. And so if you think about it from a relationship perspective, now you can almost be, especially in this niche, right? And in, in this genre here being very sniper like and, and saying, I want to meet so-and-so specific names of people. And, um, and you don't have to have a following of, you know, 2 million people on Instagram to be successful. You can just utilize the strategy to really be specific about meeting people. So really what you're doing, in my opinion, is you're, you're getting interest from these people that you might want to work with by offering value, which is you're going to be a guest on my podcast. And as an outcome, we're going to build this relationship, get to know each other, and then maybe there's an opportunity to work together. Is that basically right? 
Yeah, you're giving them, you're providing value, but more than that, you're you're helping them, you're edifying them really is what you're doing. You're helping to edify someone and put them in a good light. And you will likely have some type of an audience and it varies, right? Everyone reach, shall we say, varies the level of business that they're you know at or what stage they're at. Um, but you could promote them to your email list. You could promote them on your socials. You can edify them. You can take clips from a macro long form interview and take out little snippets and put them on social, even provide them with the snippets. Um, one of the tools I love right now is called Cast Magic. And as a host, you can you can connect your RSS feed to Cast Magic and all of your episodes go through it and it will generate, it, it's built on AI, but it will generate, you know, top 10 takeaways from this episode. Or it will allow you to do little snippets of audio. You can do audiograms and all kinds of different things that you can then provide back to the guest to, to invite them to share that on their socials. So you're creating content for them. There are lots of different ways that you can about, go about doing it by providing value, but more importantly, I think it's the um, the edification and, and helping them to get their message out to your audience in some way, shape or form. If I'm in one person business, this sounds great in theory. And then I think to myself, oh my God, this is so much work, right? I need to find, get, I need to do the research. I need to find who to talk to. I need to invite them. I need to record the episode. Yeah. You know, my editor convinced me to buy a microphone. I have a, you know, Oh, oh, fancy microphone here, right? I love um, it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, and then and then of course I I got to edit it and I got to produce it and you know there's quite a bit of work and and there's some cost associated as well, right? I mean, we pay our producer or editor, sorry, uh, you know e every week to to clean these episodes up and produce them and write all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and this takes time. It takes time. It takes energy. How what what do you tell that business of one to say? Hey, like, how do you make time for this? I'll say this in our in our program, we part of the reason why we built in producing a podcast for our clients is for that very reason, because we did not want them to be doing all of those activities. We wanted them to be focused on actually building the the relationship and focused on their authority building and focused on serving their clients and having conversations. And so that's part of the reason why we included that as a done for you element of our program. But having said that, not everyone's in our program, so I get it. If you're a solopreneur, I think that, especially with the tools that are available today, you can get really efficient in terms of production. Eight years ago, we didn't have some of these tools. Five years ago, we didn't have some of these tools. I think there's a, a variety of different routes that you can go. You can hire a podcast production agency, and yeah, there's a cost to that. There's a cost to that. And you have to weigh that, weigh out that cost with what kind of ROI or benefit that you're getting on the business side of things, which I think is the reason why it's even more important to have a good strategy, to have a strategy of, am I actually leveraging this podcast to build the types of relationships that I need to produce in order for me to make this make sense? Um, one thing that we, we teach is it should be, or podcast as a host should be leading to either, um, prospects for your, whatever it is that you do, partners that could be referral partners. It could be a strategic alliances, integrated partnerships. I think we were kind of hinting at earlier today, um, joint ventures, any different kinds of like collaborations could be content collaborations, all kinds of different opportunities. And then the third one, the third P of the triple P podcast monetization strategy is platforms. Podcasting is a form of stage. It's a platform, but there are lots of different stages. And so through your podcasting and you're building that relationship, there might be other opportunities for more platforms, other types of stages, maybe a conference, maybe a cruise, maybe um, a Facebook live or any number of different stages that people have that you can get in front of. And you have to weigh that out. I mean, but I think it's true of anything, Bradley, that you do in business. You have to weigh out the, the investment with the return on that investment. And if it's not making sense, then you either have to revisit the strategy or, you know, do better with that strategy or change it up in order for there to be an ROI or, or just not have it make sense at all and then do other things. In your professional opinion, because this is the sales and marketing bucket of my business and the other buckets, right? There's the back end piece. There's of course the client delivery service delivery piece. Those might be the, the three main buckets as I think them, right? 
what percentage of my time as an independent should I be spending on the sales and marketing piece? That's a good question. Gosh, I would say probably, oh, sales and marketing, I would say probably half, maybe more. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I would venture to say that it's pretty high. I would bet if we asked our listeners and said, hey, how does it feel to spend 20 hours a week? Let's just say a 40 hour work week. How does it feel to spend 20 hours a week on sales and marketing? I think most of them would say, you're crazy. Like, I don't have time for that. I don't have energy. Like, I got to do all these other things. What are they missing? Like, cause, cause I'm with you, right? I don't, I don't know if it's half, but all I know is most people don't put nearly enough time into it, right? It's almost like an afterthought. Well, I think it's because we, we come from a, at one point, there was a time when all you had to do was post an inspirational quote on Facebook and get a client that, that, that has happened. We're not in that era anymore, but I think when you have people who maybe were taught or who lived through that point in time where that's how they were getting clients. And then all of a sudden things changed and the world changed and it got deeper and changed again. And, and they did not evolve with those changes. And now we have AI on our forefront, like it's changing all the time. So if you're still marketing and selling the way that you did, you know, even five years ago, you have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. The market has changed. So it's not enough. And I think one of the, the misconceptions is the, the sheer number of outreach and, and the sheer number of, um, let's say, contacts that you need to have in order to truly move your business forward. Like it's more than you would maybe think, you know, and that's part of the reason why I like the sniper approach that I'm sharing with you today, right, around podcasting is because you can be really precise and specific as opposed to kind of the spray and pray approach and, and hoping that you, you know, get some prospects that way. I just don't think it's as effective anymore. If, if I think of the spray and pray approach on one side and the hosting you on a podcast on the other side, as far as sniper and building this, a, a really thoughtful relationship, right? Cause either way we're spending 30, 40 minutes talking to each other, right? There, there's certainly some collaboration, get to know you. There, there's quite a bit of uh, cross connection there. What are some other strategies that are maybe more in the middle where you get to build relationships where it's not the spray and pray approach? It is effective, but it might be a little bit less of a time commitment than the podcasting. I think for that, I would probably say a live train, like some type of, of training, like guided training element would probably be the middle ground of that. I like the idea of, for example, use Facebook as an example. We have people who have pulled together communities of people on Facebook into various groups. And you can approach the admin or admins of said Facebook group who are the people that you know you can serve and either ask them outright or start a relationship with them to be able to have an inroad to be able to provide or offer up a free training for their audience. That could be an approach as well. This idea, whether it's a Facebook group or any other type of, of stage, but this idea of really demonstrating your expertise by doing a training, I think is a great approach as well because it builds trust. It, it shows you know your stuff. And I think especially in the if you're an agency owner or if you are, again, a fractional <laughs> executive, you, like, you really know your stuff and you probably have some things that you can truly demonstrate and you could just do you know, a, a 30 minute or 45 minute training with 15 minutes of Q and A. And now you're going to be demonstrating and also getting people to raise their hand going, I'm really interested in what it is that you've just demonstrated there. Um, can we talk? And that's really what you want in this, in this world. Now you want to be, especially if you have higher ticket programs or monthly retainers and agency um, level products to sell or services to sell, you want to get people on calls. Yeah. How do I get people to that training? If I'm using the Facebook group example. Um, you could you could help the admin of that Facebook group to drum up interest by pre-recording a video that they would then post in their group. Uh, it could be a joint video together. You do a live stream into the group, um, insist that or even provide the swipe copy to the Facebook group admin to send to their email list if they've already gathered, gathered those emails. So you could do what you can to make it as easy 
as possible on the Facebook group admin to help promote your appearance in front of them. And, you know, putting you on the spot here and you're, you're, you're doing a good job thinking on your feet of coming up with creative ideas. Um, but it, it continues to highlight to me the importance of going through all the steps required, right? It's like, come up with a way to get in front of people, podcast, training, whatever it is. Then you need to go out there and you need to market this training. You need to let people know it's happening and maybe record a video. You need to do these things. Like they don't, they don't just fall in your lap. And I think there's so many people that come to me. I get this LinkedIn DM all the time. They say, Hey, I'm a, uh, you know, fractional data scientist. Let me know if you have any companies that are in need. And I'm like, what, what do I look like to you? <laughs> this is just, it's, it's unbelievable. I would say multiple times a week, I get that request and. Um, it, it's mind boggling to me of how people think the world works sometimes of just, oh, I'm just going to throw this in your lap because well, let's, let's use that as the example. What would sure. be a better approach for that person to get Bradley's attention and to truly build a relationship with you might be for them to either have some type of stage that they could invite you to speak on or to come and do a training or sure. a podcast that they could invite you to be a guest on or some way you're going to respond differently to that person when they say, hey, I have an opportunity because I, I see you as an expert and I've done some research and I can see that you're an expert because I've taken the time to actually not send just a cold <laughs> DM here. I've done some research, right? And so you're going to react very differently to that outreach than you did in this particular exam. Yeah. And now you have an opportunity to connect to meet each other, to get to know each other. And I use the dating analogy a lot because it's absolutely appropriate. Yeah. It's, hey, I'm interested, if, and I'm happily married 22 years, but if I was in the dating scene, right? And, and I was, again, looking to, you know, interested in someone, well, what would I do? I might invite them to have a coffee. Does it make sense for us to have a coffee? That's a 15 minute virtual coffee conversation. Hey, what are you up to? What do you do? I wanna get to know you. Okay, where you live? You know? And you get to know someone and then you get to decide, do we go out on a date date? Like, should we go out for a fancy dinner next? Do we like each other enough to do that? And if not, that's cool. But it's that pr process of, of building the relationship that is missing in the example that you just shared. The thing I really want to highlight is if that data scientist comes to me and has value to offer me, right? Yeah. Such as getting on the podcast, right? That is certainly a, a kind of value or, you know, I don't know. I have to think of other examples, right? Because I don't know if I'd want to spend time on a workshop t having him teach Fair me enough. data science, right? Sure. Um, but th there certainly are kinds of value that people can offer me to say, hey, let's build a relationship. Let's get on the phone. I want, because you're even us taking this time here, we're both spending time on this podcast now because there's value, right? There's value for my audience to learn from your experiences. And there's value for my audience to learn about your program, right? That they might either want to attend or learn from, or at a minimum, sign up for your newsletter, something like that, right? So we're both choosing to take the time to do this because there's value created both sides. Because you're right. We are in the process. That's what's happening here. This is part of the touch point of you and I building some type of relationship to get to know each other. So what's going on in the back of my head right now, as I understand who you are and what you're doing is... Who can I connect Bradley to? Who are people that I know in this space that would be great as his next guest that I could make that introduction to? That's what's going on in the back of my head, providing more value. How can I do more for Bradley after this recording is done? And that's what a lot of people don't think of. They think of things as very transactional. It's like, I'll be on a podcast and it's a transaction and that's it. And what they're missing is that it's if you look beyond the transaction and you think about it building a, a that this is one touch point on a road toward building a relationship, it changes the game. And I've thought about that angle because I'm a big believer in thought leadership content on LinkedIn. I'm a huge believer. I've been doing it for many years now. And my my highest performing posts, and it's not all about post performance, but the ones that have the most engagements are where I share this inside look about an experience at Uber building up one of the markets or what it was like to launch a new city or something like that. And what in, in reflecting back on it, it's, it's an inside look of how something happened at a brand name company on a really big scale. And so the person reading that is learning 
And also learning something that's kind of, you know, confidential, if you will. It's like you wouldn't really get that information if, if someone at the company didn't share it. And, and so people write tons of stuff on LinkedIn, obviously. But I think if we can write from this same principle of, of adding value, right, to you, it's not about me. It's not about what my experience was at Uber. No one really cares about that, frankly. Right. And that's okay. They do care about learning something, right. Or a, a different experience or a different perspective or how it can be helpful to them. And that's what I found to be the most impactful. Yeah, I agree with you. And there is there, they, they care about you if you tell stories mm. and link it back to why it matters to them. So storytelling is important from the perspective of again, demonstrating and the kind of, I've been there and here's the lesson I learned and here's how I would do things differently. Or if I had to start over, all those, those stories are um, rooted in your experience. What a lot of people do is they tell stories to soothe their own ego, right? And there isn't any tie back in terms of how does this apply to the person who it's intended for? That That's often, so the people do care about um, but with the stories, so long as it always comes back to why it matters to them. Right. Because if I think about that data scientist, one of the hardest things to do is track attribution of marketing, I find in business, right? right. Where do people come yeah. from? Okay. So yeah. if that data scientist publishes content on how they can use a data infrastructure to better track where leads came from, Google, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever it is, I'm interested. And not only am I going to learn and get value, but I think of that person as starting to become an authority figure to your point about that concept in their space. Like they know what they're talking about and it's not BS. I'm seeing it, right? Maybe it's a quick video or a tutorial or whatever it is. So that's a good example, right? Of I could really learn something from that person and maybe then I have a question about it and I can follow up. Hey, saw this, curious how you, you did X, Y, Z. Let's jump on a call. And all of a sudden that person now has a sales call, right? Authority is really important. The thing that I love about podcast hosting is that you position yourself as an authority by simply being the leader of that yeah. podcast entity and of that distribution channel, shall we say. So for people that feel like they're lacking on the authority side of things, hosting their own show can be and provide a lot of value within your company as a brand and as building up your authority. So coming back to the ROI question earlier, okay, so you're a solopreneur and you're not in our program and you're not having it done for you. You, you are paying someone, an outside agency to produce that. And so what is the value of that production? There's value in positioning yourself as an authority. Now that might not necessarily mean that it's measurable. Um, and I'm sure that those data scientists have ways that they can measure, you know, how much you build your authority, sure. but that has massive value. And you have to count that in your ROI. You have to count that in, well, how much value is this bringing me in the outside world and in the marketplace to position myself as an expert? There's lots of value to that. So that yeah. has to be taken into consideration. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good point of the, the downstream and additional impacts of a podcast. Like I wouldn't, it wouldn't have run off the top of my tongue of, oh, now I'm the authority figure right? But it makes sense. And so it, it can help people with confidence and help people in their market. And just for our listeners, you know, we launched this podcast maybe about a year ago now, but really started to invest more in it in the last six months. And we don't have a fancy logo. I don't have a fancy jingle to welcome it. I don't have, I don't have all of that fancy stuff that all the big podcasts have. I don't even have sponsors or anything like that. And my podcast editors, it's a few hundred bucks a month, right? It's a guy I found on Upwork. He's very good at what he does not expensive. He has his own system. I sent him the stuff and he posts it every Thursday and it's a pretty easy system. And then the best part is I take the transcript and I turn it into a blog, a newsletter, LinkedIn post, and tweet. So, Love right. It. Yeah. So this amount it is an investment of time, but oh my God, it pays so much dividends and just the social proof and social awareness and impressions everywhere. And um, anyway, so I just want to share that with our listeners because it doesn't have to be this massive undertaking. Right. It yeah. can be you can make it a massive undertaking if sure. you want. Yeah. But you have to understand really have you have to have business self-awareness. Business self-awareness. Like where where am I at? What stage am I at? How much money am I allocating to sales and marketing? What does my budget for that look like? 
Can I find someone that's less expensive, but still accomplish the goal? Or do I have to hire the $3,000 a month production agency? Maybe I don't need that. You know, so there's lots of choices to make, but I love what you just shared. It's so important. People often don't get started because they want to have everything perfect and they got to have the background and the set and all the things. And you don't really, you don't really, especially if you're executing on the strategies I'm sharing today, which is about building relationships through your podcast, guesting and hosting. It doesn't even really matter that much. Now, do you want it to look professional? Yes, there is a gray area. I have seen podcasters who execute what we've just shared and they don't do it very well. And it's de detrimental to them. Sure, That's a problem. But if you have a nice clean, like you do, right? You have a nice clean background. We have a decent web camera. We got good audio, right? It doesn't have to, you don't have to have all the fancy accoutrement, if you will, in, right. in order to make it go especially if you're leveraging this particular strategy. And then over time, you can add those things in as you grow exactly. and as you build and as you, your business grows, you might decide to hire the fancy uh, $8,000 guy to do the, the background with the fancy lights. That's cool, but right. do it when it's appropriate. Do it when it makes sense. Right. You know, and so don't let that be the thing that stops you. You can get building relationships doesn't really, um, it can be affordable. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I just love the idea of, of getting started, right? Just get it good enough, 70%, 80% of the way there, and then just, just do it. And I think it's so scary for so many people to put just content out in, in the world. It's, and, and there's all these fears. I see it every day with our customers of what if this and what if that, and I'll get rejected. Someone will say, no, somebody will make fun of me. It's like, look, if someone makes fun of you for your podcast, that says a lot more about them than it does about you. Right. Like, let's be honest. It's something that we're, we're, we're recognizing. We have 80, I think 84 people in our program now. And one thing that we've recognized is that the mindset aspect of business building is something that we hadn't anticipated really spending that much time on, but now we're realizing we do. It's something that plagues practically every entrepreneur. The stuff that goes on between your ears is, is the bigger game. Yep. And you have to be persistent and resilient. And, and you, you know, you definitely want to be um, that person who can persevere because there will be ups and downs. There will be ups and there will be downs. And you have to be able to make your way and be committed to your endeavor right through all of, all of those ups and downs. And it's important. It's all to do with how you think. It's a hell of a journey to put yourself it through. It is. Sure. It's the best yeah. form of personal development oh, you will yeah. ever put yourself through. <laughs> yeah. And and people that haven't been through it, you know, we talk about how hard it is, but it's just not the same if you haven't experienced it. No, so like you just got to do it and you got to kind of get, you know, you're going to get metaphorically slapped in the face a number of times. And yeah, you just got to keep picking yourself up and, and just keep going. Belief. It's, it's, it's when you believe, and we, we talked about this recently on one of our leadership calls, when you know what your big why is, why are you doing this? And this gets talked about a lot, but people don't really take it that much to heart. They think, oh, the big why, I've heard that before. But what does it really mean? It means getting in touch with yourself and asking yourself, why am I going to be, what is so important to me that I'm going to put myself through this? Again, your big why could be your family. It could be your, you know, any number of different things. What is it that what's driving you? Because you need to have that driver to move you through the different, you know, echelons. Getting to six figures, you can hustle your way to six figures. Then six figures to seven figures, it's a different strategy. Now you have to rebuild it in a different way. You have to have different things that you take into consideration. And then from seven to eight, it's another thing. It's a whole other echelon. It's always going to ebb and flow. It will always evolve. And you have to be ready for that journey, depending on how high you want to bring it. One of the things I'll share two things, then we do have to wrap up. I could talk to you forever, but <laughs> um, it's fun. It is fun. The um, two things that I've done. One is I wrote down my why. I think it's one thing to know it. It's another thing to to actually have it written down, even just in a Google Doc. And I was like, why the hell am I building this company? Right? Because it's so hard at times. And just revisiting that on a maybe monthly basis, I have a check in on the calendar. Like, go visit your why. Right. Um, so that's one. And then two is, I think, especially in the early phases, it can be really hard to see progress, 
right? Because you might not have customers. You might not hit your first 100K yet, like, or even your first 10K yet. So I started just writing down all of the little things that I had done. Right. Even from like incorporating the company to just like buying a domain to, okay, I have a lawyer help me with the agreement, whatever, just all this stuff. And over time, I had this pretty big list. Right. And then I got my first hundred dollars, first thousand dollars, first ten thousand dollars, first employee hired for like everything written down. And anytime I felt really bad, I would go back to that. And I was like, okay, you know what? I've come a really, really, really long way. And yes, this is hard right now, but you know, I've come a long way and, and I'll, there's a lot. A lot of momentum continuing me forward. That is really a, a great strategy for the moments where you are down. And we all get there. You know, I have, I have moments for sure. You know, I, I say this and I've said this publicly before. You know, some days it's like it's hard and I'll just have a good cry <laughs> every once in a while. I just go, oh, just get it all out. And I just have a good cry. And then I go, OK, oh, all right, I'm ready. Let's go. Um, but I love what you just shared. We don't often take the time to recognize and celebrate the small wins along the journey because we're so focused on the next thing and hustling and, you know, whatever stage that you're at and it is busy. So having something where you can come back and go, you know what? Hmm, I did do some amazing things. Look at what I accomplished, right? 95% of people can't do that or, or haven't done this. And then it makes you realize that you've, you've done some good things and it can just be enough to bolster that level of confidence to keep you moving forward on your right. journey. I, I, it helps me to think about the growth journey of an entrepreneur as essentially a stock chart because, you know, every stock has pullbacks, right? Even, you know, even if you look at like Bitcoin or anything like that, there's these massive pullbacks. But at the end of the day, if you look at the S&P across the last hundred years, yeah. it's up and to the right. Right. Exactly. So, right. When I have that, you know, bad moment, something bad happened, customer got upset with us, whatever it is, like I'm in just in a trough, right? When I have that, you know, bad moment, something bad happened, customer got upset with us, whatever it is, like I'm in just in a trough and that, and that's okay. We're going to recover from that. And I'm, I'm much higher than the last trough, right? The last trough was down here. This one's up here. So like I'm moving in the right direction even though it feels pretty bad in this moment. Um, and you have to really reconnect with yourself and the reason why you're doing what you're doing. You know, So if you're building an agency, it's probably because you wanna have monthly recurring revenue, you wanna have a stable income, you, know, you wanna serve people, you're great at something. And, and so if, if that's what's driving you, maybe it's on creative services and things that you enjoy to do, um, what, a, what a wonderful life. I mean, to be able to you know, think about our ability today to start a business online, right? Being able to, again, like I'm up, I'm up at the cottage right now uh, and have the freedom, as long as I have an internet connection, I can run my business. I can be on this podcast with you right now. I can do whatever it is I need to do and have, I don't really believe in work-life balance as much as work-life integration, mm -hmm. but it's integrating it into your existing life. Um, what a wonderful era that we live in. I think we should think about how privileged we are to have these opportunities in front of us. Yeah, it's a great, great note to end on. So I appreciate you sharing. Um, I always love to give our guests a minute to just shout out your own services. Like really, what is it? Where can people find you if they're interested? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is iconmakerlive.com is where you can go to learn more about our next upcoming workshop. We do these four hour deep dive workshops um, and we charge a nominal fee that's uh, donated to charity. And so you can certainly look at that iconmakerlive.com. We go deep, so be ready. <laughs> we go deep. Um, and we talk about next level strategies. Another thing that we do on Facebook, we have a group, it's a private group, but you can request to join. It's called Podcast Monetization System hmm. for, for guests and for hosts. And we talk and we do these live trainings every week where we teach various strategies on how you can leverage guesting and hosting to monetize, hence the name. So you can certainly join that as well. You can find it on Facebook, um, Podcast Monetization System. Okay, great. And we can, if you send me those links, we can include them in the oh, show sure, notes on YouTube Thank you. and everything like that. So, and then where can our guests find you individually? I, I'm, I'm active on Facebook. I'm active on LinkedIn. Um, Inst you can find me on Instagram. I'm not as active there, but if that's your platform of choice, you can also send me a DM there as well. Okay, great. Any last words of wisdom to share with our audience before we drop? I think it's where we just ended this, this conversation. Get in touch with your why. Get in touch with why you're building your business and let that be the, 
the, the conduit, right? Let that be the driving force to get you through your next echelon, whether that's your six figure echelon or your seven figure echelon or different strategies when you're growing, know that. But as long as you are leveraging opportunities, whether that's through podcasting to build relationships, let that be the foundation of how you approach your business. And I trust, trust me, it will transform how you, how fast you grow. Amazing. Well, Cheryl, this has been such a pleasure to chat with you and discuss all these topics. So thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely.